Hey, everybody, today on The Beats, we have a very special guest. Dr. Beth Dupree is a breast cancer surgeon, board certified in surgery and integrative medicine. She worked in this Philadelphia area for many years. She's now working out in her, fur, in her full practice out in Sedona, Arizona. She's also a Reiki master, an inspirational speaker, an author, a pilot in her spare time. Uh, she's a philanthropist, health and wellness enthusiast, to say the least. She's written a book over 14 years ago now called The Healing Consciousness, A Doctor's Journey to Healing. And Dr. Dupree, as a surgeon working in the field of breast cancer, has been intimately involved in the world of lymphatics, primarily with myself and uh, Desiree Despong in the same field that we've worked in. And she has a wealth of knowledge to educate us about breast health, about preventative, about the difference between the uh, genetic component and the lifestyle component when we are talking about breast cancer and how we can enhance our own health and ensure our own, our own health. Dr. Dupree has also started her own foundation. You can find her at drbethdupree.com. And welcome to the episode today. Be sure to share this with your friends. This is information that needs to be mainstream. And here's one of the greatest doctors in our world to share with you how. Welcome back to Beats with Kelly Kennedy. And I'm <laughs> Very honored, truly, and have a very special guest with us today. As you know, we are very interested here on The Beats with understanding how our body works. And this very special guest, Dr. Beth Dupree, is not only a board-certified integrative doctor, but she's a surgeon, a breast surgeon. And she's worked all across this country. She's currently in Arizona, but she's made a big impact here in our area, in the Philadelphia area. She set up foundations and institutes, and we're going to dive into all that because there's not many doctors here in the United States that understand lymph the way this amazing guest does today. And if you want to know more about breast, your breast cancer, your breast health, that's why we're talking to Dr. Dupree today. Welcome. Thank you so much for giving us your time today, Dr. Dupree. Thanks, Kelly. And I love what you're up to. You're, you've, you're doing amazing things and uh, really holding the lymphatic system, overall health and wellness, um, the, you know, wrapping your arms around what everybody in our country needs to do right now, which is looking at how do we prevent disease? How do we look at our overall health, body, mind, and spirit and create a path forward because our world's been disrupted by COVID. It's been disrupted by so many other things in the past, but I think we're at a really critical point right now where the world has been so disrupted by a common thread that people either need to come together or they're going to transition. They're going to move on because um, there's no place in, in the world to think that you can continue to abuse your body and your mind and your spirit and get away with it. So I just got chills throughout my whole body. For those of you that are just listening, please write this down or please go get this on your Amazon. Dr. Dupree wrote a book many years ago now. I mean, I feel like a record. Yes, read 2006. 2006 called it is Consciousness. Right. The so the, yeah, the whole the whole deal is going to be as soon as I can take a few weeks off, I will finish my second book called Shifting Gears. But I have been a little too busy, and so I need to I need to kind of get on it. So, but that's the point, you know. She's a Reiki master as well, and what what Doctor Dupree understands is that as you go into surgery to handle your breast cancer, whatever she's dealing with, mostly breast cancer she comes from it from a very different perspective. She's, uh, she's having consciousness about all of it. And what she's saying to all of us is that we need to have consciousness about what we do and how we treat our bodies more now than ever. Although she wrote the book 14 years ago, it's, it's more prevalent now than it's ever been. And yay, she's writing a second book called The Shift. But tell us, so you're a breast cancer surgeon primarily, correct? Right. Yep. That's my day job, which I just literally got out of the operating room and I'm going in right now because as I'm talking to you, the little thing came down here that said that I didn't write my discharge order, which I know I did, but maybe I didn't sign it. So I'm going to multitask for a second here, which sure. is fine. But um, my day job is a breast cancer surgeon. I treat all aspects of breast disease, benign disease, cancer, mostly cancers. And it has been, um, it's been my, it's been my primary purpose um, in healthcare up until 
about, let's say, 1996, 95, um, when several of my girlfriends were diagnosed with other diseases, which um, really shook me to my core and said, you know, if, if people that I care about who are doctors, um, if we're dying of diseases and we're getting diseases that we should have been taught either how to prevent or how to treat or how to do whatever in medicine, we need to get it together because um, not everybody's, you know, none of us get out of life alive. And if we don't heal the things that we need to heal in this lifetime, we're going to be back doing the same lessons over and over and over again. So that is something that I think everybody has to kind of take, you know, pay attention to. And the lymph system becomes important because as many of you who are listening have known, either you have friends that have had breast cancer and maybe you personally have been affected by breast cancer, they always look for the sentinel node. They're looking for the lymph nodes that are closest to the tumor. They want to remove those and they want to make sure that you get clean margins, not just around any tumor, but around any area, like if it's DCIS, any area that might be encapsulated in this in this diagnosis. So you were introduced to the Lymph Star technology well over a decade ago now, and you've been working with that. What would you say, why has why have you turned to working with the lymph care before and after with your surgical patients? So I've, I've always cared about the lymphatic system. Um, in 1995, I went to Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York to learn how to do sentinel node biopsy because in my surgical residency in the 80s and early 90s, we would literally go into a woman's axilla, whether she was having a lumpectomy or mastectomy, and remove anywhere from 15 to 30, 40 lymph nodes. And most early stage breast cancers, even if it's in lymph nodes, you find one or two lymph nodes that had tumor, but you've now just disrupted what I call like, it's the greatest filtration factory our body has. And if you think about it, you know, you don't want to drink unfiltered water. Do you want the parts of your body coming through there and not having, you know, the, the Brita filter to be able to take out the impurities, take them in, let them get eaten up by macrophages and put good stuff out. So I learned how to do sentinel node biopsies um, because it was, it was a state of the art and you know, I always say lymphedema is the gift that keeps on giving. If a woman gets lymphedema after breast cancer, um, you may cure her cancer, but she may live with an arm two, three times the size of her other arm. And it is not something to be taken lightly. It is absolutely um, one of the worst complications that can happen after a cancer diagnosis. And, you know, we've gotten very good at curing early stage breast cancer, but when we were removing all those lymph nodes, you cure a patient of cancer and then you have her live in a place of anger and fear and frustration because she's got an arm that is too big. She can't wear her jewelry. She can't wear her watches. Um, we are then at that point unable to get blood draws and do other things like that when the arm is swollen. And once lymphedema appears clinically, you, you're not, I mean, if you, if you visibly see it and it's, it's there, there, it's not going to go away. It's going to be a chronic problem. So, um, First things first, I learned how to do sentinel node biopsy, um, went and got trained, adopted it, was an early adopter of the technology, um, and have been utilizing sentinel node biopsy now since um, mid-90s. After that, we did a clinical trial called Z11, where we could decrease the number of lymph nodes being removed and look to see, can we shift all of breast care and say, do we really need to remove more lymph nodes? You know, even if you find a positive node, do you have to take more out? So We've come to a place now in 2020 where many times we can remove two or three lymph nodes and get even a better answer about whether or not tumor has spread than we did you know, many years ago, removing lots of lymph nodes. And in this process, um, it was, you know, I believe there are no coincidences. Serendipity, my, my dear friend, Wendy Brown, um, actually is the person who introduced me to, and I don't remember Jean's last name and I should have looked it up, She's a nurse practitioner in central Pennsylvania who her son went to for um, Lyme's disease um, care. And she, she told Wendy about LymphStar. Wendy wow. came back, told me about LymphStar. That's how I got connected. Ah. Then, then I met Lori Sweet. And then I, you know, then I, Marcy took it over and, and Desiree. And it was suddenly this whirlwind of, oh my gosh, this is an amazing technology. How come not everybody's using this? 
And um, I brought it into my health system back in Philly at Holy Redeemer Health System. And when I came here to Sedona, it was an instantaneous yes. It was a, it was a, it was a full blown yes, we're going to do this. So now we have multiple machines. Um, and, you know, fast forward to the next place, which was there was a technology that came out years ago called Impedimed, which you would put these little like EKG pads on your extremities and, and do a bioimpedance measurement. Well, that's now turned into a, a device called Sozo, where when my patients come into the office with a diagnosis of cancer, before I ever touch them surgically, they put their hands on our little gizmo and it measures the bioimpedance of their whole body. And we, we can now actually find subtle shifts in the extracellular fluid so that if someone's starting to trend up, we can treat them and bring them back down to normal so that they don't develop lymphedema. And that is huge. That's beyond huge. I mean, you're really looking, you're preparing the patient before they have surgery to make sure that they're going into surgery, the best possible, you know, level of everything so that when they are done, they're not going to deal with chronic issues because their lymph actually works. So you're right. telling from bioresonance, from biofeedback, getting information back from the body of how that flow is going with the fascia and the lymph. And you look at the, that's looking at the fascia too, I would imagine. How is it not? Because the fascia is encapsulating all the lymphatics, right? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overall measurement of your, of your extracellular fluid. So that it's all, we're all a big, you know, we are, we are one major, you know, collective organism and it's how it all works together. But, you know, lymphatic issues were so overlooked for so many years. Um, it was kind of like, oh, it is what it is. Put somebody in sleeve and let them go. And um, now, you know, the shift, I was, I was fortunate enough before COVID at our um, American Society of Breast Surgeons um, last meeting, Catherine Bates was the keynote speaker. And, you know, she got up in front of a room of like 2000 breast surgeons. And she was like nervous. Here's this woman who, you know, she's played every role you can on TV of the crazy lady. And she's like, I'm so nervous. I'm talking to all these doctors because like, I have a chance to impact you because she's had bi she's had bilateral upper extremity lymphedema. And so she works with Learn, the one of the organizations that's very much involved in lymphatic um, education and lymphedema prevention. But I, I have to say that I don't know, I mean, there, my partner, Dr. Stacy Kreischer, who runs the program at Holy Redeemer, you know, we now have all of the same tech, we're, we're doing the same thing in central Arizona as we do in Philadelphia. And what a lot of people don't understand is not every big, can not every big cancer center is adopting this forward thinking, proactive, um, preventative approach to lymphedema care. And uh, I, I'm very fortunate because my, you know, Sherry Ramond and uh, Tiana Hall jumped on board and Allie, like they, the, my therapists out here were like, oh my God, we finally have someone that because they weren't seeing patients before surgery. I mean, all of my patients go for lymphatic education prior to surgery, you know, and I kind of hammer it home to them, you know, the easy stuff for me is, you know, listen, if your BMI is over 30, you're at high risk for lymphedema. Um, it depends how you eat, how you exercise, how, you know, so many factors that we're just not focusing enough in Western medicine at preventing this. And uh, anyone going for cancer care needs to be, they need to be asking the right questions. And so let's say they're not going for cancer care. Let's talk about true preventive wellness for a minute. You know, let's say they're just out there walking around, they're worried about getting COVID. For me as a practitioner, my first response is go enhance your lymph somehow, some way, shape, or form. Go yep. move your lymph, right? Because if that's where, as you called it, not your toxic waste dump, but your garbage, you called it something earlier. It's early. a filter. It's your filter. That was great. It's your filter. So change your filter, right? You want well, your think, think, think about it. Your immune system scaffolding is your lymphatic system because it's your lymphatic system that's carrying all those cells. That are going to be able to fight and, and provide immunity. Um, I have my own little lymph star, so I just brush myself and do my little do my little stuff. My girlfriend just had her knee fixed. She had a bad knee replacement a year ago, and um, right after surgery, I started using the lymph star on her just to um, you know stimulate the the uptake of the fluid. Um, I personally, it's like the most relaxing massage you can ever have is a lymphatic massage with a lymph star and um, a couple of times from going on vacation, Sherry, my lymphedema special is like, stop here before you leave. So you totally just, 
detoxify before you get on a plane and go somewhere. But obviously we wouldn't be getting a lot of planes lately, but you still have to do it. You still have to take that time to care for yourself and improve your immunity the very best you can. And so from your perspective as a surgeon, why do you think everybody's lymph is so stagnant in this day and age? Like, you know, do the, do the deer and the rabbits out in the, well, maybe you don't have deer and rabbits out in Arizona. Do the lizards- We do, we do. <laughs> yeah, we, we, get, we get all that stuff. Do, you know, are they as toxed out as we are as, ho- as humans, do you feel? Well, think so. I, I just gave a lecture to a bunch of breast surgeons last week about, um, looking at diet and nutrition as it's related to breast cancer. And I put up a, my, I have a slide where I have the human breast and then I have a factory that, that homogenizes milk that comes from cows. Now, uh, I, I, people should not be eating dairy. Just, just get over yourselves. Um, I come from a lot want- of dairy farmers, Dr. Dupree. I have been I know. eating rice for years. Know. Get off the cow. I know. And you know, when, when I, when I say to a patient, they go, Oh, but cheese is so good. I go, Oh, so would you go to the farm and like lay down and start drinking milk from a cow's teeth? That's what you're doing. And when you think about it, um, you know, you're putting a substance into your body that is so inflammatory, that is so, um, not nurturing who you are. Um, and so the, it's not just eating, drinking the cow's milk. It's, if you think about the fact that that cow can make that milk, how does the cow make that milk? Well, all that stuff goes through their body. It goes into their teeth. It, they pull out the, 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 the proteins, create the milk. The human breast does the same thing. There's no other organ in the body that can take all of the substrates, everything that flows through the breast, turn it into a substance that has the right nutrients, the right protein, um, the right makeup to be able to sustain a human being for two to three years, maybe right. even more than that. I mean, obviously you don't want to be breastfeeding kids till they go to college, but you know, breast milk is made. So the factory that we, that I care for every day, which is what, you know, the breast, that factory is so vulnerable and is so vulnerable to the toxins that how many toxins can your body take? Alcohol, tobacco, all of the um, DDT, all of the um, all of the, you know, toxic things that are we exposed to every day in our lives. And that's why the breasts are so vulnerable. That's why you're seeing more breast cancer because of all the environmental issues. It's not just genetic. I mean, people forget that breast cancer is a disease that is related to lifestyle more than anything else. And so you take so, away the six, that. please repeat that for those listening, breast yeah. cancer surgeon, Dr. Death, Beth Dupree. Wow. You're, it's, you know what? It's okay. Lynn Doyle did it several times and she's still my very dear friend. So don't worry about but it, Kelly. Hopefully we can still be friends after this. My tongue is getting twisted. But that's amazing what she just said. Breast cancer is a lifestyle disease more than it is a genetic disease. So think about it. About 6 to 10% of patients actually carry a specific gene we can identify. You know, another up to 25% total has a relationship to a family history. So 75% of breast cancers come out of nowhere, de novo, no history, no nothing. 75%. Biggest risk factors, you know, having children late, not breastfeeding, drinking alcohol before you have your first child, um, not breastfeeding, um, never having children, um, being obese in, in, you know, in eating a crappy diet. And then there's the other factors, the stress factors, the poor sleep factors, and so many factors related to breast cancer are under our control. They are the epigenetics. They are our ability to be able to have control over what our genes do um, when they express themselves. And so you think about the breasts, which are the, they're the little milk factories and those little milk factories are very vulnerable. So what we do at the youngest ages, I mean, and this is why we've got to rewind this clock completely back to good care. And you know, when people say, well, do bras cause cancer? Does deodorant cause cancer? Well, you know, I stopped using deodorant a million years ago. I use a salt stick. Why do you want to stop a process? And I'm not, I'm not some crazy lunatic that's saying that deodorant is causing breast cancer. What I'm saying is our body has normal functions. Why would we want to stop those normal functions? So, you know what? So my armpits get sweaty and it might show on my shirt, but I don't stink because I use a salt stick and it's healthy and it's fabulous, but that's not something that I was taught 
in college or med school. I learned about it when I became a board certified integrative medicine. And, you know, it was actually one of my Australian gurus who was like, get rid of, you know, like you, you know, everybody should be switching to salt. And, and then when you start looking at the science behind it, you're like, why would we be backing up our, um, why would we be backing up our um, lymphatics in any way that we possibly can? Like we, we need to, you know, move it or lose it. And, you know, our sedentary lifestyle, biggest, you know, biggest thing with another big thing with breast cancer is exercise. We don't exercise like we used to. My mom used to hang out six loads of laundry a day and she didn't have a dryer. So she washed it in the washer, walked up the steps, walked next door, hung the laundry, you know, down to the basket, up to the line, down to the basket. I mean, what do we do now? We are, we are the sedentary beings, which are now locked in their homes because of COVID. So, you know, when, when people are like, oh my God, you, you've got to isolate. Said, well, isolate your ass at a park and walk 20 miles. You know, like you're, you don't have to isolate yourself in your house where you know, you think you're going to be safe and the virus isn't, the boogeyman's not going to get you, get outside, get outdoors. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm fortunate to live in Sedona because, you know, I'm out on the trails, but it's funny. I, I still see people, they have their mask like stuck to their face and I'm thinking, oh my God, we're at 5,000 feet and we're walking on a trail and, you know, I will socially distance from you to go past you, but you want to be breathing through that thing in the outdoors? Like, how good is that for you? Right. Right. It's so enlightening and encouraging to talk to somebody of your status in all honesty. And I know for so many of the listeners to hear it from somebody who deals with it every day, as you see it in the, in the fatty tissue that lays in front of you to excise out the toxicity and, and pray for them. I'm, I know you do pray for them, that they get the lesson that they change their lifestyle. I mean, we, I've talked about this with some of my colleagues um, tattoos. Can we talk about those for a minute? Because tattoos are scars. I have a tattoo. My husband has tattoos. Many of my staff, if not all of them have tattoos, like tattoos have become such a thing as a yeah, no shit. Oh, and, don't, and you can't I, even, don't need, uh, okay. So here's us, the thing. Tell us about that. I, I, um, I think one of my first patients I operated on, um, that it really hit home. Um, she was a young 26 year old, um, I, and I was doing pro, I was doing risk reduction surgery because she carried a gene. Okay. And so I'm doing the mastectomies and I just remember, I mean, she, she had a fair number of tats and I, when I got to her axilla, every single lymph node was bright blue on both sides. And I'm thinking she's taxing her lymphatic system. Does she not know what she's doing? And like, I never thought about tattoos that way until I, but a lot of people don't know. Cause like, I'm in the operating room. Maybe I should take some photos next time and say to people, this is what your lymphatic system is doing. It's working overtime and it's scavenging up all of that, um, ink. all of the ink. And, you know, we use blue dye in the operating room sometimes, which you pee out that day. And it was funny because at the time I saw these blue nodes, I'm thinking, oh shit, did I inject her with, you know, isosophane blue? Like, I, and I had that moment in my brain. I'm like, oh my God, it's her lymph nodes. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not an anti-tattooer, meaning like I'm not some kind of prudish person that thinks that tattoos are evil or bad. It's just that it's what they're doing to, to your lymphatic system is it's making it work overtime. It's just another thing you're spending, quote unquote, spending your immune system on that if you have a lot of immune system to spend, go right ahead. But if you have a little bit of taxed immune system, be conscious about it. Be conscious about how you're living your life, about the things you're putting in your mouth, about the things we expose ourselves to. Because if not, then our body has to filter it out. You know, I, I started my journey 25 years ago selling water filters and air filters. And the little ah. thing today was be a filter or buy a filter. I like that. It's the same thing that you're br really bringing all my worlds together here today. It's like, you can either be the filter <laughs> or you can stop eating the crap to be the filter and stop exposing yourself to the crap to be the filter and just live a proper lifestyle, go outside, breathe fresh air, have joy. Yes, be responsible. If you're sick with COVID, please stay home and quarantine yourself. But if you're not sick, go outside and breathe. <laughs> Get some fresh air. Get some fresh air. So lymphatics, let's jump to that for just a moment. What's the number one thing that you think in Western medicine outside of understanding that it's the immune system that we could all do actionable steps today that we could do for our lymphatic system? 
everybody should be doing some form of strength training and movement because with every muscle contraction, the lymphatics are getting, you know, they're getting that pump and the muscle pumping really helps with the limb, with that limb, with that lymphatic action. Um, and so a combination of aerobic and strength training, you know, it should be part of everybody's everyday life. And listen, I, I went to work yesterday. I got, I got in the office at six 30 in the morning and I left at seven o'clock last night. And then I ate dinner and then I did charts till 10 30. I did not exercise yesterday. I was beat, but I did what my body needed. My body needed rest. Now, when I'm done with you today and I go back to my office and I do a biopsy and I get on another conference call with Holy Redeemer about diversity. Then after that, I've already penciled in my time that me and my Peloton are going to have a relationship this afternoon. And, and I'm already kind of psyching myself up for a 45 minute ride, not a 20 minute ride. Cause I didn't do it yesterday. And then I will do core fitness and I will do upper body strength because I, um, you know, I, I try to be a good example, but I, you know, we struggle with it. People think, oh, they say, oh, well, you're naturally thin. I'm like, I am not naturally thin. Like, I, I put on the COVID-10 at least because I wasn't, I've been so busy working as a doctor through COVID because breast cancer didn't take a COVID break. Right. And so my life hasn't backed off at all. It, if anything, it got, it got busier because people were less willing to want to go to Phoenix. And, and so my life has been kind of crazy out of control. And I am now trying to recreate that balance. And I'm a work in progress, but if you recognize that we're all a work in progress all the time, you just celebrate the small victories. And, you know, I always say to women, you know, don't stop beating yourself up. Like the woulda, coulda, should is you should all over yourself all day long. You're not going to get anywhere. You know, and it, it's really, it's about mindset and resetting. And, you know, so I have to hit my reset button five times a week. It is what it is. We're not perfect. But yet that's beautiful though. That is, I believe that is perfect, honestly, Dr. V, because I think the reality of consciousness is being aware that we're all a work in progress. And, you know, I've done exactly what you did. I worked 15 hour days, 10 hour days, and you make up for it on the other side, but you don't just keep going at that pace and thinking that you're superhuman because you have the knowledge that you could just go ahead and do it. You got to still do the work, you know, flow Preza, which I know you haven't had a chance to experience. And once I can't wait orders open, I'm flying to Arizona. I know. I know. It's amazing. But the one thing I love about this is that I get on this myself. And unlike with Limstar, I've got to be like a little active when I do I it. Know. You don't have to be active at all. And it feels like the big hug that we all need and the, the squeezing, like you talked about the compression, but it puts that yeah. deep relaxation state. And I'm excited. For we, we were supposed to, we were supposed to be in Philly last weekend for a fellows course. And I was hoping to get Sherry to come and get on it. Cause it's mm -hmm. something that, you know, I, they, they asked me what I need for my budget for next year. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, I'll get you or I'll get Sherry in it sooner, but I really appreciate you talking about everything you did today with the limp, because I think that so many practitioners, doctors alike, and I'm going to get you a little bit spinning on the, the podcast circle a little bit more, get your information out there because you're one in a million, Dr. Dupree. There's not a lot of you out there and we need more of you and we need more people educating at the level that you're educating and working at the way that you're working. And we give you a lot of gratitude. A lot of my clients have gone through Holy Redeemer, have been through there, or I've seen them afterward. And the work you're doing, like you said, it's not unfortunately being done at the big hospitals yet, but we need that. It's some of them, but we need it to be done as the standard of yep. care everywhere and we have great gratitude for you and all the work that you're continuing to do and all the education that you do and let us know when your book is out we'll have you back on we can talk I about will that. I will and and you you know that I, I mean I've always been interested and um, proactive and a um, you know absolutely pushing for lymphatic care but it's it was my relationship with Marcy McCall and having Marcy as my lymphedema as my or as um, Desiree says my lymphologist um, to have to have someone that you work with who is so passionate about it and I I and I didn't know that I would ever find anybody else and I do have that here I mean Sherry Tiana Ali like these the women that are working with me in the lymphatic care of our patients in northern Arizona are extraordinary and I could I can't do this in a vacuum I couldn't do this by myself I don't have the bandwidth to do it but they have taken the charge they have jumped on board my nurse navigators are amazing because they make sure because the patient's like, Oh, I don't want to do another appointment. I don't want to go see this lymph 
lymphy person. It doesn't affect me. And it does. And we, we all need to, to wake up and patients need to go before surgery so they understand it and they can recognize the signs and learn how to prevent this stuff. And, you know, we, we're trying to make this the standard of care for breast cancer care so that, you know, patients aren't going to need other interventions down the line. Like you said, with all the lymphedema, that's huge. And well, I know that when you get this, you'll find that between this and LymphStar, they'll feel this unlike LymphStar. Like I love LymphStar too, but they don't necessarily feel it. this. You cannot get out of and not feel the difference. So maybe we'll make it's that It's like happen. having a big bear hug. It's a big bear hug. Huge hug. It's like hugs and they can be clothed. They can be in a room by themselves for the, the concept of COVID. It's ideal, but I agree with you. And we'll just pay homage to our wonderful friend, Marcy, who has passed. She has done an, a huge, a huge thing for all of us to connect us, to bring this technology to us. Oh, I to know. The amazing woman that she was and continues in her legacy as we all continue to put the word out there about lymph and people to understand. And she was one of those outliers that nobody understood why she got cancer. She was extremely active, extremely brilliant, physical therapy, like brilliant on every level. But there was some- and she did it all right. And she yep. did everything right. Yep. But yep. her legacy lives on because we're going to continue right. to do the work. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. And you can find Dr. Dupree at drbethdupree.com. We'll have all that in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to give out as far as make, how to contact you? No, they just, I mean, I'm on, uh, it's the same at Dr. Beth Dupree on every social media thing. And uh, I am, uh, I, I've taken a little hiatus from my YouTube channel. I'm really trying to put together high level stuff and and I, I would love to talk about Flow Press on YouTube. I was going to try to get Desiree. I thought she was going to be here in person. It's like that COVID has been a little bit I of a shutter downer. I forget we, yeah. we were going to arrange that. I know. Trips over, but we'll get that happening again. The world will be reset as we are resetting ourselves and we'll continue to do our work and we'll get it together. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. And uh, if pe people, they, if they send messages through my website, I will answer them actually. So excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you for, from all of us. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Take care.